Please pray with me. Holy Blessed One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So listen carefully to this. They were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven came the sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages. <laughs> okay, so what's going on here? Is this just another one of those deep but wacky biblical symbolic incidents that we nod our heads wisely to and say, oh yes, that's very important and very miraculous, and then we shine it on and go back to whatever it is we do all day? A sound like a violent wind <clears throat> filling the whole house. <clears throat> Tongues like flames of fire on top of their heads. People suddenly speaking in different languages say, what? Today is Pentecost Sunday, a remembrance of the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit filled the first disciples. On this day, inspired by the Spirit, they began to proclaim the mighty works of God. So let's back up and unpack a little bit. You know how much I love to unpack. First of all, Pentecost was an established Jewish holiday, originally a harvest celebration, later tied to God giving the law on Mount, um, to our Jewish brothers and sisters on Mount Sinai, and it's still celebrated among the Jewish community as the Festival of Weeks, or Shavuot. It is, in the mystic language of the rabbis, the night on which the law, as the bride, was joined with Israel, the bridegroom. There's three important things for us to know about this festival of Pentecost. First of all, it's a festival of pilgrimage. According to the law, all Jewish men, patriarchy alert, are supposed to come from wherever they are to Jerusalem and physically be present during the celebration. Secondly, it was a formal social holiday. No work, no shopkeeping, no school, although I imagine our sisters were busy making food and serving and cleaning up. But it was party time for those in charge. And third, there were certain celebrations and sacrifices and offerings that were prescribed in the law for the day of Pentecost. The high priest, because this was before the rabbinic era, was to take two loaves of freshly baked wheat bread from the newly harvested wheat and offer them before the Lord. So, the streets of Jerusalem are packed with thousands of pilgrims, and here are the disciples. It's morning, and if you read the rest of this uh, chapter, you'll see that, and they've probably been up all night praying, and probably up in that upper room where they like to hide and gather, especially since Jesus' execution, they were hiding. Suddenly from heaven there came the sound of the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. The words from heaven are meant to make us realize that this is not a weather event. It only happened to them there and then, and it was of divine origin. And it wasn't a gentle breeze. It was a violent wind, demanding attention and capable of great impact. The word for wind in Greek, and most scholars agree that Acts was written by Luke, and Luke was Greek and wrote in Greek, means spirit as well. The word wind is the same as the word for spirit, just like ruah in Hebrew means both things. But it's interesting that the sound of a violent wind is very deliberately written. Not that the wind was felt, it was an audible effect. It was buffeting their eardrums, not really mussing their hair. We relate to the mussing of the hair. Okay. And then from the audible to the visible, the famous tongues as of fire. Not tongues of fire. You know, our minds immediately go to the cognitive impact of red because that's metaphoric and we understand that. And it's a wonderful symbol. But it's fascinating that the very intentional and deliberate use of the word tongues, the word used is meant to call to mind the tongues of the human mouth, mentioned throughout scriptures as a powerful weapon or a powerful tool. And it is also supposed to remind us of the story of the Tower of Babel. Remember that story? In the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, we read of this attempt to build this big city and this tower that will reach up into the sky. In the ancient world, this would be an incredible undertaking an accomplishment of overwhelming human effort and considerable resources. It also takes for granted a very brutal toll on human um, 
on human beings and on the exploitation of the environment because it is said in that chapter that these are going to be handmade bricks, not the natural occurring stones and mortar and mud that were typical of the time. Without getting into Midrashic and Kabbalistic interpretations of this, and if you want to see me later, this goal, this goal to build the biggest tower ever is a parody of human pride and egotistical self-reliance. And it's very clear and deliberate metaphor for moving away from the providence of God that exists through the gift of creation. This famous tower is a very poorly uh, disguised reference to the Babylonian Empire, a bloated, corrupt, and proud entity whose priorities were both unhealthy and unholy. And this building is not being constructed to meet a need. It's a symbol that represents the seeds of empire, those tiny little germs of all of that which turn us away from God and to our own egos. As we read that story in Genesis, God sees all this human action like a person looking down on a little bunch of busy ants. And in, a li in language that highlights the mediocrity of human endeavor minus divine engagement, comes down to see this tower built by the children of men because he cannot see such trivial nonsense, nonsense from where he's positioned. So here comes the caveat. No, I don't think that God is a big old dude in the sky on a throne. You know, we, we need to always remember that our scripture uses the intensely powerful cognitive linguistic tool of metaphor, and that's where we're supposed to start. This is a parable. It's profoundly moving and teaching uh, moments of um, spiritual mythology. So in the story, God then scatters the people and diversifies their languages so they're unable to understand each other. By confusing tongues, by creating non-communication, God keeps humanity from experiencing truth with a capital T. Human truth without God at its center can only ever be incomplete and conflicted. So with the tower story, we have people speaking in different tongues, babbling. You know, you know that's where that word comes from, right? Babbling at each other. But when it comes to Pentecost, the tongues experience is one of unification, an intense inner and outer transformation, a turning back to God. It's a reversal of Babel, a reversal of the dangerous seeds of empire, all that greedy, pride-driven human ego trip. In Babel, the language of the people was confused, and with Pentecost, it becomes united and unified with God. Pentecost reverses the seeds of empire. It's a prophetic turning back to God and away from all that which separates us from God. As author Matt Anslau puts it, the community created out of Pentecost is the reversal of empire. It does not exploit or oppress. It is not human made. It does not dictate truth. I love the metaphor of the loud rushing of a great violent wind that sweeps people off their feet and the burning tongues of fire that settle on the disciples because they, as theologian Jürgen Moltmann says, possess and excite not only the conscious levels but the unconscious depths too. And they set the men and women affected themselves on the move towards unsuspected new things. Deeply moved, we ourselves move and we go out of ourselves. He calls these movement metaphors because they express that amazing feeling of being seized and taken over by something overwhelmingly powerful. And that surrender, that being taken over, is the beginning of new movement within ourselves. And the disciples were moved. They were basically hiding in this upper room, waiting for whatever was gonna come next to them as far as some sort of direction. Jesus was dead and they were suspect. Followers of Jesus, the radical insurrectionist Yeshua ben Yusef, rabbi from Nazareth, and they risked arrest and punishment and death. They were walking on eggshells. They were, as we say, keeping their noses clean. This Pentecost story shows us how an undeniable experience of the Holy Spirit takes these intimidated disciples and turns them into freed witnesses to the Christ. Apostles of the gospel who can now carry the tidings to the ends of the earth. In the reading, it says that a crowd gathered. So obviously, they had been moved out of their little hiding place in the upper chamber and had gone outside, either into the street or perhaps into the forecourt of the building, 
forgetting their fear, taken and sent by the Spirit, they were now among pilgrims from all over, and they were speaking in such a way that everyone could understand them. Suddenly, they went from being hidden away to being part of a rambunctious and loud and energetic crowd, symbolic of both outreach and unification. Out into the world, Pentecost. In a moment, they became sent people, people who have been so deeply moved that they can now respond only by going out into the world, seized at it as they are by the zeal and the zest for life, this passionate fire. So what does it mean for us to live in the Spirit and live by the Spirit? It means to truly feel that life-affirming, life-giving love of God, like an overwhelmingly powerful force in our lives. It's in our gut. It moves us to something unexpected and new if we trust it and if we let it. This chapter in the book of Acts goes on with Peter telling the crowd, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he exhorted them saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And Eugene Peterson, I know not everybody likes Eugene Peterson, but Eugene Peterson paraphrases this and says, get out while you can, get out of this sick and stupid culture. Can we relate? And later in the reading it says, and all the believers lived in wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. Was met. I love that. True communal living. True distribution of resources and wealth with no power games or class distinction. For a very brief time, there was a group of human beings living lives centered on God in a community that held all goods in common, provided for one another, and was inclusive of all. It was a community animated by the Spirit of God. This Pentecost story, with its sound of violent wind and visible tongues of fire, it serves to remind us that the truth of a new way actually exists. A safe and a sane way out of the soul-deadening clutches of empire. It's up to us to take hold of the promises of Pentecost. We're never so far gone that we can't still be powerfully moved to give our newly open and radicalized hearts to God so that we can still be the people of Easter hope, the ones that have experienced resurrection and rebirth. All we need to do is to leave the safety of this sanctuary and bring God's love and our hope to a hurting world out into the pilgrim-crowded streets of our world, our Babylon, this empire. I said that the new way is safe and sane, but that doesn't mean it's easy. What's easy is worshiping Jesus. And that is undoubtedly why he never once said that we were to worship him. He said, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, heal the sick, raise the dead, and he said very clearly, more than once, that we were to follow him, to put down our worldly things, to take up, take up our cross, and to follow him. So how did he know to mention a cross when he had yet to be condemned and executed? And it's because he had come of age, seeing the crucified bodies of Judean rebels lining the main roads of where he, where he was. He knew what the game was. Jesus always had known what the game was. And when he was begged to fulfill the one messianic model of leading armed rebellion against the Roman occupation, or when he was tempted with power, he always turned that down. Jesus did not play that. In a world where the Spirit is breaking in, in a God-oriented and Christ-saturated world, the usual means of exchanging power systems, a military coup or a democratic election, those aren't available. Sacred community can only be built upon our surrendering our egos by using only two tools, prayer and service. To follow Jesus means to give up our illusions of security, our demeaning drive for wealth, our selfish desire for salvation, and to go out into the world and live our lives for others in the name of God's love. And I can tell you that the empire of this world, with its laser focus on material wealth and status and self, we have a magazine called Self, that world does not want us to do this. 
Because to live our lives in God's love for the benefit of others is to deny the values and the priorities of our current day Babylon, Hollywood, Madison Avenue, Wall Street, to live lives of divine love directly challenges the intense and seductive pull of consumerism, of technology, of hyperconnectivity, and instant gratification. The wind and fire of Pentecost are shockingly powerful once we open our hearts and let God's grace and the Holy Spirit in. We need that power and momentum to take us from our self-centeredness and the safety and comfort zones that we've built out into a world desperate for God's unconditional love. We are called. May we respond by being the sent people, the Pentecost people, Easter people, people of hope, people of unconditional love.